43, we're going to talk about chords. Huh, I'm wondering why you're 15. Secrets. Um, and tangents. Has anyone on this Is anyone on? Not yet. Sometimes people will join in, but I'm still recording it anyway, so I'm going to use this as the recording, my flak math recording. So... What? I haven't been featured in a You're right. Before. You haven't. So. I'll gotta, come up eventually. You gotta work you in. I'll take my time. To the movie. Okay. So, um, a lot of these you guys know, but let's start with what I we do know. When we go right across through the center, what's this thing called? Diameter. It it's a, a it's diameter, diameter it's a right? Okay, now this is actually a chord. This is a chord. Why are chords spelled like that? It feels like it should be pronounced chord. <laughs> or like same with like child. Like yeah, you're right. Choyer, choyer. Okay, English language. Though. And okay, okay. I have a complaint. So you know like Boise City? Like, you know how it's spelled like boys? Like noise? Why is it boy city, not Boise. Sorry. Wait, the B L I S E? Yeah. So you know how like it's noise. O -I. No, but think about like noise. Like you're making a lot of noise. It's spelled N O I S E. So why is in Boise boys? Like it noise. Boys. No, it's Boise. No, it's Boise. I yeah. Know. It's kind of weird. Boise, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up in Des Moines. Or well, uh, by Des Moines. Yeah. It's uh, there town called Ankeny, but Des Moines, yeah. So that's where everyone says, like, Des Moines. Des Moines? Well, it yeah. looks like Des Moines. Yeah. I grew up in a town called Des Moines. But it's Des Moines, yeah. And I have friends who say they live in Arvada. It's not Arvada. Oh, I say Arvada. Arvada. It's Arvada. Arvada. You guys have to say, please, who wants to say Arvada. Arvada. No, it's not Arvada. Well, here's the deal. Did we already talk about Buena Vista? Buena Vista. I know, but people in Buena Vista pronounce it Buena Vista. Those people should be bullies. Well, it's not a lot of pronounce it There's such a thing as good bullying. Yeah. <laughs> Productive bullying. Yeah. No, don't Sometimes do that. it's needed. Okay, so guys, this like is a, a chord. <laughs> this may be a new term for you. It's not a, a, what you play on the piano. Um, but it connects two points on a circle. Okay. It's a line segment, so it starts and stops on the circle, okay? So a chord is a line segment whose endpoints lie on a circle, okay? A secant is just like a chord, except it goes all the way through and it keeps going. So this is a secant. But every secant has a portion of it which is a chord, right? So this part of the secant is the chord of the secant, the secant goes all the way through. So a, a secant is a line that intersects a circle at two points. Okay? So a, a secant is a line that intersects circle at two points. So underline line and underline two. Because there's something else. So this guy So a tangent. Not like a tangent, like oh that they went off on a tangent. But it kind of kind of has the same type of feel, like it just goes off. Like maybe there's one point that connects that conversation to your conversation. But the person who went off on a tangent just took that one point and then everything else they talked about was didn't have anything to do with what you're talking about, okay? So you can kind of think of it that way. A tangent is a line that intersects circle at one point. So underline one. Okay, 
And then this guy is called the point of tangency. Now, ironically, this has nothing to do with trigonometric functions. Remember those, Tori? Sine, cosine, tangent. Um, just kidding. I use them in physics. <laughs> so, I should know them, but I really. Oh, Sokotoa. Yes, nice. Good so job. it's like opposite over adjacent. Um, Dude, oh, you are. I don't remember. Nice. That's great. That's kind of like so Sokotoa, sine is. Tangent over sine? Tangent is. So Toa, so O A. Yeah. So tangent is opposite over adjacent. Yeah. Yep. I remember like. Good job. I should. Can I get like. So proud. Can I get her problems after that? It's like, yeah, so you can use that anytime in Algebra 2 that you want to. Come <laughs> on, we're talking about it now. Okay, so look at, let's uh, let's share our screen because we can. Okay. Just a little. Okay, so now everyone has to see my large head in their camera. Sorry, I'm working on it. Um, where are you? So let's look at these examples here. Okay, so I want to identify, let's uh, share a screen, boom, boom. So I want to identify a chord. Can someone tell me a chord? A, B. A, B is a chord. What else is a chord? Um, yeah. C, D, yeah. As long as you say line segment C, D, line segment C, D is a chord, okay? Um, what, about, what about a secant, okay? Yeah. So EF is actually, what is EF? The that's, line. That's a, that's a tangent. So a so secant would be CD. CD. The line CD is a secant, but the line segment CD is a chord. You see the yeah, difference? The key is radius or diameter. Well, there's not really any diameter that's drawn, but you could probably draw one. Maybe it looks like CB. If you were to draw CB, it might be a diameter. But really, PA, PB, PD, PE, or PC are, is a radius. Yeah. Okay. What A B probably Yep, or A E. Yep. That looks like it would go through. Good. All right. So um, let's uh, move on. I think we're moving on without sharing screen anymore. Okay. So a couple theorems. So you guys can write these down. Yay, I love the Will we be on the test? Not the next test, no. Okay, no, no, no. That's the next semester. I don't need to worry about that. I'm so theorem 43 one. I'm kind of done for this semester, honestly. Theorem 43 one says okay. if a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord and its arcs. So let's draw a picture of that. Um, we're going to stop sharing the screen for a second. Actually, we'll we'll just draw it here, and they can see it on the little little screen. So, if I have a diameter, but diameter is perpendicular to a chord, so see how that's the diameter. Yep. So the diameter looks like that. The chord. Looks like an X. Yeah, it looks like a kind of. There. So if it's perpendicular, you see that that will bisect it. Bisect means cut it in exact halves. So these guys are the same length. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. All you have to do is draw it sometimes, and you, you just use your gut. Oh, yeah, those are the same. So if in, in your homework, if you see that a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, and it says this is 8 and this is x, 
then what's x? Also eight, okay? So far so good? So 43, two, the diameter bisects a chord other than another diameter than it is perpendicular to the chord. That's the converse of 43, one. So if it bisects, then it is perpendicular. So if we know that this is not, so if we know that these two line segments are the same, then we can say that this is perpendicular. That's a right angle. So let's see what happens if it doesn't, if it's not perpendicular. So if I drew a chord still intersecting that line, see how this does not equal that. Just to say that it's different length. So they're hash marks. So if you see a one hash mark anywhere else, you see a one hash mark, it's the same length. So there's no other two hash marks, there's no other three hash marks. As long as it's the same thing. Yeah, except the hash marks and angles look a little different. The angles are like that. Um, and some textbooks, though, it'll have a hash mark on the actual angle, which, yeah, that can be confusing. Okay, you guys good with 43.1 and 43.2? So if you look at um, these examples, what's X? Three, because it's, why? Because of 43.1, right? 43.1 says if it's perpendicular, no. Yeah, 43.1 says if it's perpendicular, then it's then it's equal, okay? All right, what about this? Uh, the question probably is what's the measure of that angle or question just says find the measure of ORP. Well, it has to be 90 degrees, right? Because that's what perpendicular is. So if you see that they're the same, then those are going to be perpendicular. All right, let's fill in the blanks here. Okay. Yeah, so AC is four. And then 14 inches. What about eight? What's AP? Yep, so that'd be seven. Which also says on that side. All right. So now we've got a right triangle. So we've got four on the bottom, seven on the on the hypotenuse. How do you figure out what PC is? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. If it extended the bottom, then PC would be seven. Okay, but it doesn't. So how do you figure that out? Yes. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. What's a? What's b? And what's c? A squared is seven, it's well, well, it's seven squared, so it's 49 plus 16 equals. Okay, but remember C is the hypotenuse and seven is the hypotenuse. So the 49 needs to go on that side. Oh, uh, that's P. Uh, so 16 yeah. minus 49. Yep, so 16 minus, or 49 minus 16, yeah. Thirty-three. So B is just the square root of thirty-three. Boom. Or not B, not B, but it would be PC, right? The length of this is between B and C. Okay. So that's kind of cool. You have to figure out that puzzle. You have to figure out the missing component by figuring out other stuff. You kind of narrow it down by makes it a little bit easier. Okay, all right, let's see here. All right, one more theorem, 43.3. So what thing are we starting? Are we going to work on it? No, well, we'll start it like we did last time. You can start it here, and then you can finish it on Thursday, the last day of school. Or you could just take it home Tuesday night and finish it. But if you want to finish it in class with me here, 
then you're welcome to do that. But Thursday, that last day of school, will probably be more of a fun day anyway. Can we also just take it like home or like on Thursday? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Okay, so the perpendicular bisector of a chord contains the center of the circle. Okay, so anytime you have a chord, so here's a circle. I'm going to draw a random chord, uh, like right there. If I drew the perpendicular bisector, remember a bisector cuts it in half, and perpendicular is perpendicular. So, so see how if I drew that, which is kind of the same thing as the other theorems we had, because it bisects it and it's perpendicular. So yeah, that's going to be the diameter. So that's what 43.3 says. The perpendicular bisector of a chord contains the center of the circle. Well, actually, I checked, and it's just that's just my view. So um, I I joined the well, Zoom call on another device, you. and it's not that. Okay. So, but. <laughs> I think we made some progress here. Yeah, good I job, think, team. Yeah, I think we did really good, but I think we had a quality day. But All right. So this is just a proof. We're, we're just going to walk through this proof together. Uh, first of all, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second so it's a little bit bigger of a video so we can see all the stuff that we kind of walked through, figuring out that was missing parts. Um, and I'll share the screen again, and we'll go walk through that proof together. So EF is perpendicular bisector of AB. Okay, so automatically that tells us two things. We can say that, um, that it, if, it bis if it's a perpendicular bisector, that means that it separates into two congruent line segments, and if that's the case, then it's 90 degrees, but we already knew that because it's a perpendicular bisector. And we want to say that EF passes through the center of the circle. Well, theorem 43, what is, was it one? Uh, we can probably use that, but let's see what they do. EF is perpendicular, given PA and PB are congruent, definition of radius, because P is the center of the circle, right? So all radii are the same length. That's what a radius definition is is the distance from the center to a point on the circle, okay? So point P lies on the perpendicular bisector of AB. Why? Because if a point is equidistant from the endpoints of a segment, then the point lies on the perpendicular bisector of the segment. Theorem 6-6. Six, six. You can if you want. Yep, if, if you were actually doing this proof, you would. Okay, EF passes through the center. EF is the perpendicular bisector of AB. Okay, one more theorem. Theorem 43.4, in a circle or congruent circles, chords equidistant from the center are congruent. Okay, so equidistant from the center means like if this was five units, I don't know what word that is, but it's not units. If that was five units, and then I drew another, um, another chord that was five units away. So let's see here. It kind of looks like it could be. So this, if I drew a chord here, then these are going to be the same, same length. So the green and red line segments there are going to be the same. Okay. So chords equidistant from the center are going to be congruent, okay? Congruent chords are equidistant from the center. That's the converse of what we just said. So if these are, equid if these are congruent chords, then they're the same amount and then the same distance from the center, okay? Stop that share so you can see it. So if they're congruent chords, then they're the same distance. And vice versa, if they're the same distance, then they're congruent chords. Okay? Feel all right? Okay, okay. So
So let's look at one more example, and then we'll move on to 44 here. Okay, let's fill in some blanks here. Okay, All right, so if these are, um, here's what we're given. We're given that A, P equals five and P E equals three. Right. A, P equals five. So this distance is five. And then P E equals three. So these are just radii, right? So PB is five, PC is five, and PD are five. So all radii are the same distance because the definition of radius, okay? And then if these are the same distance here, see how PE is the same as PF? That means these chords have to be the same, okay? Now, can you guys remember what the length of AE is? You don't even have to do Pythagorean theorem. Why not? It's a triplet. It's a three, four, five triangle. So if five is the hypotenuse and one of the sides is three, then the other leg is four. Or if five is the hypotenuse and the other leg is four, the other leg is three. Okay? If the hypotenuse was 10 and one of the legs was eight, what's the third leg? The second leg, six because it's just a multiple of the three, four, five triangle. Okay, good. All right, what else are we asked to find here? Find CD. Yep, so if, that, if that's four, then it would be eight. Good. And you know it's eight because this is gonna be the same length as CD. CD and AB have to be the same since PE and PF are the same, okay? All right, how's that feel? That feel okay? Is it a, a lot? Okay, so we learned about chords. Remember the chord, it just goes, it starts and stops on the circle. Boom, we learned about sequence. It does start and stop on the circle, but it keeps going. There's a portion that is the chord portion of the sequence, but it keeps going. A tangent just touches it in one spot. Um, and we'll realize later that this is always going to be perpendicular to the radius that it touches. Okay. All right. And then we just utilize some Pythagorean theorems. We learned some other theorems. But remember, a lot of these theorems are things that um, just look the same anyway. Like these look, if I drew this correctly, that green and red line segment would still look the same. Okay. All right, so let's move on to 44, um, unless there's any questions. Any questions at 43? Okay. Okay, so 44, here we go. 44. Okay, we're going to apply similarity. Okay, wait a minute. What is similarity in geometry? Same yeah, proportional. Yeah, it's actually the same shape, yeah, but a different size, right? Yeah. So, for example, this triangle would be um, some these triangles would be similar, like Papa Bear and Baby Bear. Okay, so these are not the same. Um, 
distance, but they're proportional. So these guys, the, but the angles are all the same, right? The angles are congruent. But, but these are not. So if this, this had like a scale factor of two, this could be five and 10. This could be um, like two and four. And this could be like three and six, right? So they're all proportional. So you can either figure out the missing sides using the scale factor. How much more, what times five is 10, it's times two. So you can just double each side to figure out the missing ones. Or if you're going this way, you cut them in half, you divide them by two, okay? All right, so we're gonna apply similarity um, to find unknown measures. Okay, so here's example one. Uh, let's just look at it on here because it's probably difficult to draw correctly. So let me move to that lesson here. So see what example one looks like. Using similarity to find unknown measures. So here's some hexagons and we're given that they are similar. So that means that all those dimensions are proportional. Now the scale factor is a little tricky because so if you try to divide 20 by eight to see how much larger that is, well, you get 2.5. It's the, it's a, they're, divi they're, they're are divisible by four, so you can reduce it if you wanted to. And then you'll end up with basically five halves when you reduce that. You divide them both by four, you get five and two, right? The 20 and the eight. So five to two. So how do you get from two to five? You multiply by two and a half. So you could do it that way if you wanted to, or you could set up some proportions and use the fish method. So if I wanted to find X, well, I just have to match up 20. So if I go 20 is to eight, as let's see, X is to six. Do you guys see that? So you go 20 is to eight. So this 20 over this eight, because they're in, this, they're in corresponding positions, right? The top left side of this hexagon, the top left side of this hexagon, 20 is to eight as the top side is the top side over here. So 20 is to eight as X is to six. Do not reverse that. Don't say 20 is to eight as six is to X. That'll mess you up. Okay, so now you can figure it out by uh, fish method if you want. 120 divided by eight. What's 120 divided by eight? Good, 15. All right, and that kind of makes sense. Because if you multiply six by two and a half, what's two times six? 12, and then what's half of six? Three, so 12 plus three is 15. That works, okay? Now, how do you figure out why? What proportion can we use to figure out why? Well, yeah, if it's, if it's 15, that was the same one we got for X, so Y has to be six. But you can do it the same way. 20 is to eight as 15 is to y. So this time you put the 15 on top. On the, on the top if you're trying to find y. Okay, so 15 times eight is 120 divided by 20, you get six. So that makes sense. Use your gut too. If you can't figure this out with proportions, what does it look like? They, uh, um, the illustrators of most, most math texts, it goes against their core to draw this incorrectly. So these are mostly, not all of them, but mostly correct and accurate um, drawings, okay? All right, moving down. Let's look at example two. Again, same kind of thing, guys. We're just applying similarity, but we're gonna do it a little different here. So let's share this. Let's 
screen. What'd you do? No, no. Okay. Sorry, one second. Okay, so don't be confused by all the crazy exponents and variables. Let's just set this up the way we normally do and see what happens, okay? So we get... Now, here's the cool thing is that we're given something. Guess what we're given? The regular pentagons. What's regular mean? Yeah, all the sides are the same length. So 12 has to equal x squared plus 4. 12 equals x squared plus 4. How do you solve for x? Get rid of 4. You can do it this way. So x squared equals 8. Square root it, so x equals the square root of 8. And you can reduce that radical if you want. 2 radical 2, because that's radical 4 times radical 2, right? Well, radical 4 is just 2, and radical 2 just stays. So x is 2 radical 2. Um, if you were to... Uh, reduce that, you never, or actually try to figure that out. You could, but let's see here. Did I do this wrong? Oh, it doesn't. Why did I say that they were equal? I'm sorry. No free problem sets for you guys. Why would these be equal? They're not equal. They're just similar. So the, the sides are not equal uh, length. So, uh, so, it's, so 12 is equal to x plus 4. Right. Similar. Well, they're similar, so there's some kind of scale factor. So here's what we can do. Uh, we know that 12 is equal to 3y minus 6. So 12 has to equal 3y minus 6. All those sides in that first pentagon are the same length. Okay? So what's y? Well, add 6. So y equals 6. If you add 6 to both sides, you get 3y equals 18. 3 times what equals 18? Y equals 6. So if Y equals 6, here's what you can do. Oh, and it also tells you, sorry, it, it's a 3 to 2 ratio. <laughs> so that means that 3 is to 2 as 12 is to X squared plus 4. Okay, so the ratio of the bigger pentagon to the smaller pentagon is three to two. Wait, if it's three to two, how is it? Oh, so I was thinking You could like multiply by one and a half. So X squared times one and a half has to equal 12. You could do it that way. Um, or you could do the fish method, which is this. So I'm just gonna go like that. But really you can do equivalent fraction method. Three times four is 12. So two times four is that. But I'm gonna do it the fish method. So this is 24 divided by three has to equal x squared plus four. So eight equals x squared plus four. So x equals two. Yes, x squared equals four, so x equals two. <laughs> now, technically, if x squared is four, then x could be negative two. Right? Um, and, but it, since it's dealing with the length, it's kind of a weird thing, but X can be whatever it wants to be. Yes. Yeah. So you could have done it by scale factor and then factored it out to get the order. Yep. So if you did it by scale factor, you would have gotten, um, let's see, 1.5 or one and a half or three halves times X squared plus four has to equal 12. When you multiply that out, or you could just 
multiply by two right now, and then you get three x squared plus four equals 24. Divide by three, divide by three, x squared plus four equals eight, and then that's, that's still that same equation, okay? All right, um, okay, so that's a little trickier, but um, that won't be on any test anytime soon, but if it is, we'll go make sure we go over it clearly. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, what do you think if the ratio of the bigger pentagon to the smaller pentagon is three to two, what do you guys think the perimeter is going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be the same thing. So look at this. So if I drew my pentagons here, that would be regular here. Okay, so if these were all X's and these were all Y's, how do you figure out the perimeter? Yeah, so this is the perimeter is just X plus X plus X plus X plus X, right? Or basically 5X and then this would be 5Y, okay? So if X and Y were like a three to two ratio, then this would be 15 to 10, which is also a three to two ratio, okay? So the basically if, if, two, if two polygons are, are similar, then their sides are proportionate, but their perimeter is, is proportionate by the same ratio, okay? So this is theorem 44.1. So I'll let you write this down. Theorem 44.1. If two polygons are similar, like we had in this last example, then the ratio of their perimeters is equal to the ratio of their corresponding sides. So if that was a three to two ratio in the last example, the perimeter is gonna be a three to two ratio, okay? I don't think anyone is right now, but I'm recording it. So they're gonna, the recording will have all this. Okay, so write down that theorem Okay, the proof of this is actually quite interesting. So I'm, we're gonna write down the proof here. And here's what the proof says. So we're gonna say given triangle PQR is similar to triangle STU. Okay, and then we're going to say also um, the, the proportion, the ratio of corresponding sides is uh, one to two. So we want to prove that the perimeter is also one to two. 
the ratio of the perimeters is also going to be one to two. Okay, so first step, given triangle PQR, similar to triangle STU, also a ratio of sides is one to two. Why? Because that's what's given. Okay, so if I apply uh, the scale factor, then I could say this. Um, well, first of all, another way to say that this is the case is that P is to S as Q is to T, as R is to U, as one is to two. So P to S, that's a one to two ratio. That's what's given. Q to T, that's a one to two ratio. Basically T is twice as much as Q, U is twice as much as R. Okay, so if I just do this for my next step, uh, for example, PQ, two times PQ equals ST. Why? Because all I did was cross multiply. I just rewrote the scale, I rewrote the proportion as a scale factor. So we can also say that two times uh, QR equals TU. And also two times PR equals SU, all because of cross multiply because I just rewrote these as the scale factor. Okay, so now I'm going to calculate the perimeter. So number, next step, perimeter of, how do you figure out the perimeter? What do you do? Right, so the triangle STU equals ST plus TU plus SU. Okay, so let's let's just draw a picture up here just because we can. So if this is PQR, then this could be um, STU. Okay, so perimeter, I just added up all the sides ST plus TU plus SU. Okay. Definition of perimeter. That's how you find the perimeter. That's what the definition of perimeter is. Okay, number four. How do you find the perimeter of? Um, how do you find the perimeter of? Let's see here. of PQR, that's just PQ plus, um, well actually, you know what we'll do? We don't even have to do that one. We're gonna substitute, what's ST equal to? ST is 2PQ, two 2PQ, two TU is 2QR, and SU is 2PR. What gives us the right to say that? Not reflexive. What did I do? You know, what's the only difference between lines three and four? Substitution, we just substituted 2PQ in for ST. Why? Because those are equal. So subst prop. Okay, so now what I'm going to do. Perimeter of, of STU, so same left side here. I'm just going to 
factor out the two. Look what I'm doing. Right? I just factored that two out. So you can just say that's not simplified, like the book said. This is factored. I just factored out a two with the reverse distributive property. Well, what does this represent? What does this represent? What, what about? What is this? Each, what am I doing with each side? What is that? Not area, but perimeter. That's just the perimeter of PQR. So basically I'm gonna substitute that in. So perimeter, I'm not changing the left side at all. Perimeter of triangle STU equals two times, what is that? Perimeter of PQR. Look what I just did. So with scale factor, the perimeter of STU is twice as much as PQR. Okay, so I just proved that the perimeters, perimeter is also a one to two ratio. Okay, oh, <clears throat> again, if you followed that, that's great, but you're, you won't be expected to come up with that proof by yourself, okay? Sorry, I was not sharing I'm sharing the screen, so that's not very big. So take a minute, look at that. Awesome, pause it, okay. All right, um, there's one more thing. You're basically applying similarity to solve a perimeter problem, okay? So here's an example. If you look at example four, I'm just gonna read it. Figures H, I, J, K, and L, M, N, O, so two quadrilaterals, are similar polygons similar quadrilaterals. Their corresponding sides have a ratio of two to five. So let's bring that back up. Number three on the right side is definition of perimeter. Death perim. Yeah, that's how it's like. Your looks like I know. Okay, so look at this. If we know that the corresponding sides have a two to five ratio, that means the perimeter has to have a two to five ratio. So if the perimeter uh, is of HIJK is 27 inches, then how do you find the perimeter of LMNO? Well, it has to have a two to five ratio. So 27 goes on top and this is what you're solving for. How do you figure that out? Fish it. 27 times five, 175, is that, no, 100, 135. Yeah, 135 divided by two is 67.5, is that right? I'm gonna cheat. X. Yep. So X equals 67.5, so that's the perimeter of the next one. So all you do is apply the ratio, two to five ratio, set up as a proportion and then fish it. Multiply the cross products, divide by the, uh, the third number. All right, that's all I got. Um, what I'm gonna do, oh, we're almost done anyway. So, so don't forget to upload that test sometime tonight before midnight for 10 points extra credit. Any questions? Okay. Black man, give me some math and I'll give you some flack. Black man.